QSO Today, Episode 350, Larry Tyree, N6TR. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers and accessories for the radio amateur, reminding you that the great outdoors is calling. Get outside and under the stars with the new ICOM IC705 all-band portable transceiver, now shipping from your favorite amateur radio dealer. And by LDG Electronics, whose desktop antenna tuners are perfect for your ham shack or mobile. My thanks to ICOM America and LDG Electronics for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. Larry Tyree, or Tree as he is known in amateur radio circles, loves to operate contests work DX on 160 meters from his 28 hilltop acres in the Oregon forest near Portland. Tree is a serious CW operator where good antenna design, focus, skill, and patience bring the amateur radio rewards. Tree tells his ham radio story in this QSO today. N6TR, this is Eric 4Z1UG. Are you there, Larry or Tree? Hi, Eric. 4Z1UG from N6TR. Copy you well. Tree, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Before we start with the beginning of your ham radio story, can we talk a little bit about Tree, why you're called Tree instead of Larry? Well, Tree is a uh, minor modification of my last name. When I was uh, in junior high school in Southern California, um, most of my friends were hams, and also most junior high kids makes fun of people's names and stuff, so... I was kind of jokingly called Tree within the ham radio circle of friends I had. A few years later, I was actually at home with an ankle injury and was talking to this guy in South Carolina, WA4OSM, who went by the name of Tree and told me about all the fun he had with it. So I decided to start using it more often in ham radio, and now pretty much most of my ham radio people know me as Tree. And does your spouse also call you Tree? When she's in a good mood. If I'm being called Larry or something, I know something might be wrong. Like your mom, when she uses your middle name? Exactly. Well, let's start at the beginning of your ham radio story. When and how did it start for you? Well, I started becoming sort of aware of electronics pretty early on, it seems. I guess when I was like three years old, I showed uh, a lot of interest in how a record player worked and could work it. Um, When I was about maybe seven or so, I was building these little uh, circuits with batteries and lights and nails bent over to make like a telegraph key and uh, played around with that a little bit. Uh, By the time I was about 10, I think I had my first shortwave receiver and started listening to to like uh, Radio Cuba and things like that on the air and uh, started learning Morse code maybe around that time or age 11. And finally, uh, just after my 13th birthday, I passed my novice license. What was the hometown? I grew up in Canoga Park, which you probably have heard of since you grew up in Southern California as well. Well, my grandparents lived in Canoga Park. There was a store called Sandy's Electronics on the corner where they lived. Ah, yes. I uh, spent a lot of time there buying parts for various projects and things and was very sad to see when they went away. Oh, as a kid, I spent hours and hours there just looking at stuff, smelling stuff, and finally buying stuff. That was where I got my electronic interest was Sandy's Electronics at the end of the street there. Okay, we jumped really fast to your junior high school and 13 years old and getting the novice license. But what was the first shortwave receiver? And did you spend a lot of time there? And did you actually discover ham radio from shortwave? Well, the first shortwave receiver I had, I got uh, kind of as a graduation present from sixth grade, so I would have been uh, 10 going on 11. I remember uh, waiting out in the front yard for it to be delivered every day, and it, like, never came. I don't know what was wrong with the order or something. This was back before UPS had, you know, two-day delivery and stuff like that. Um, And finally, I think my parents felt sorry for me. My dad finally went, I think, to Henry Radio or somewhere and bought. A Halicrafters S120, which uh, isn't much of a receiver, but you can actually hear a shortwave with it and kind of hear Morse code if you are careful with the regenerative BFO. Now, you said you were listening to Radio Q, but were there any other stations on shortwave that really piqued your interest? As a kid, we always spent a lot of hours listening to WWV to make sure they never missed a click. And I would tune in some of the the ham radio stuff, most of it had gone to single sideband by then, but there still were a few AM stations to listen to, like on 40 meters. 
and I would spend hours on that. Um, really, I, I was very obsessed with the radio even before I got my license. But by the time I got it, I really spent almost every waking hour on the air. Now, did you have mentors in Canoga Park? Did you join a club? I mean, how did you actually get to the point of being able to get a novice license? There was kind of a local club. Uh, again, the circle of friends I had in junior high school was pretty much the, the nucleus of everything for me. They were ones that helped guide me through the process. They knew who, who it was that would administer the novice test. And, you know, I, I would get invited over to their house uh, after school. And that's where I made my first, you know, contact over the year. I got to see radio, you know, firsthand. So it was a combination of that. There, there also was an element where a friend of my dad's had a CB radio in his garage and they'd go, we'd go over there for dinner and I would spend every minute I could out in the garage listening to the CB radio. Did your junior high school have a radio club? It didn't really have a club. Again, it was just kind of a circle of friends. There was actually a station set up at the electronics shop. As I remember, it was a Johnson Ranger 2 and a Halicrafters HQ 180 or something like that. And I did actually end up using that for a few contacts, but it wasn't really an organized club. It was just more of an informal group of similarly thinking, you know, kids. What was your first call sign when you got that license at age 13? WN6ZVC, Zulu Victor Charlie. I passed my extra about four months after that and got WB6ZVC, which I had until 1977, I think. You went from novice to extra. And in those days, that was quite a feat. You couldn't actually take the extra right away. You had to be general or higher for two years. So I, I went through the general after about four months of being licensed. Then a year later, I got the advance. And then a year after that, I got the extra at age 15. And that was um, 20 words a minute in those days. So you were quite a CW operator. Yeah, one of the uh, activities that the circle of friends of mine had that they were involved in, that they got me involved in as well, was CW traffic handling. By the time I came to the 20 word per minute test, it was basically like the guy was sending me just another message on the national traffic system. And I just basically handed him a copy of what he sent. 20 words a minute wasn't a big deal for me then. Out of curiosity, what was the first rig? I borrowed a one watt transmitter from a friend of mine that I think I used on 80 meters. I could pretty much talk to him about three miles away. So that was the first transmitter I used. I was in the process of building up a homebrew transmitter from the 1967 ARRL handbook. And it took me a while to, to get that working. And so that was uh, really my first uh, honest-to-goodness transmitter. Put out about 40 watts using a 1625 final. And uh, you had an inverted V up about uh, 30 feet or so that, that I used with that. The receiver was the same receiver, or did you upgrade the receiver? It was the same receiver, which uh, really, again, was a, quite a challenge using it, but uh, it was enough to make QSOs. A couple of years after I was licensed, uh, maybe only about a year or so, um, I saved up enough money to buy a Heathkit SB-101 that I built up, and that was my first sort of real rig. And obviously you stayed on CW, at least to get to the extra class. But did you stay on CW after that? Was that your mode of operation? I generally enjoyed CW. I, I would operate phone um, primarily in contests. Um, and, you know, there were other pe some people I would talk to just on the air and stuff. But and I found that uh, CW was obviously more effective. I didn't have a lot of power, didn't have a great antenna. So to make, uh, you know, a lot of contacts, um, CW was just more effective than using phone. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your career in education? I think so. Um, I decided pretty on early on that I wanted to be an engineer just like my dad, probably like at age nine or so. And I ended up going into uh, electrical engineering. Um, my first job I got because I knew somebody that was a ham that took the time to explain digital electronics to me over two meter FM, if you can believe that. So there's always been a strong connection. And, and even my last job, I, I just retired from at Intel. I was managing a group of signal integrity engineers. And so many of the things that you learn sort of with the seat of your pants and ham radio had direct applicability to 
the types of challenges that we had on modern day motherboards that Intel was making uh, due to you know issues with transmission lines and impedance mismatches and all sorts of stuff like that. It still plays a critical role even in the development of computers running at high speed. Yeah, you can't get away from some of the the laws of physics, if you will. And uh, a lot of uh, students, I think, miss out on that because they don't have that experience. I go out into the forest and I play with a beverage, but I can explain what that antenna is in terms of a terminated uh, transmission line to these engineers at Intel with a master's degree. And they go, oh, I get it. You know, I, I build a TDR so I can look at the impedance of the, uh, the wire over distance and they're doing exactly the same thing on PC board traces between pieces of silicon. So it's amazing some of the parallels. Now, it's my understanding from a little bit of research that I did that you got a degree in ham radio from Cal State Northridge. <laughs> that's probably on Facebook, and uh, that's kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit. Uh, they didn't actually offer a ham radio um, uh, curriculum. Um, it was more like I went to school and got an engineering degree, but I spent all my time doing ham radio. Kind of a you, you sort of fell for a little bit of a joke there. Right, of course, but that created a opportunity to ask you a question. So you got a chance to go to Cal State Northridge and you got your BSEE there? Yeah, it was a very easy place for me to go. When I started, tuition was $82 a semester, and the campus was about seven miles from my parents' house, so it was very easy to get to. Uh, it wasn't the kind of experience that a lot of people have when they go off to college and you know move into a dorm and are away from home the first time. For me, it really wasn't much different than going to high school. You know, at the time, I think the California state schools, state colleges and universities were amazing and quite thrifty if you were a California resident. Yes, they were. Uh, I know it's much more expensive to go there now. Uh, I actually spent more, I think, on books than I did tuition back then. What happened after you left college? Where did you go? So my, my college degree actually got delayed somewhat by the fact that I was working nearly full time as a technician, then later as an engineer. It took me, I think, almost eight years to actually get my degree. But by then, I was pretty much a, an engineer or a senior engineer making a very nice salary. First company I worked at was a custom systems house, which did small little odd and end jobs for some of the, the big defense con companies like Rocketdyne and uh, even JPL and stuff like that. Um, and it was a great place to learn a lot of practical hands-on stuff um, about electronics. I ended up working at a handful of different companies in Southern California that were all a direct connection to that first company where somebody would go off to some other company and then, you know, call me up and want to hire me. And probably at least half the people I worked for when I was down there were ham radio people. So there was a lot of mixing between my, my professional people and uh, the ham radio people I knew. It was a great net, you know, ham radio obviously was a great networking opportunity to open doors. For people on the East Coast, Southern California and the San Fernando Valley, was full of defense contractors and people involved in the space race and all that stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. So there was a lot of opportunity. And you spent most of your career doing pretty much the same thing, working your way as an engineer? Yeah, pretty much. Pointing out to new engineers how RF works? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Although I was able, uh, looking back, to uh, explore a lot of different uh, opportunities. I've actually had two or three jobs where the primary thing I was doing was writing software. Um, and then when I moved up to Oregon in 1984, uh, after about six months at working at my first company, uh, I was offered a management position. And suddenly I had 18 engineers working for me who were all older than me at the time. I kind of learned a lot about management through some luck and hard knocks. Um, and pretty much from that point on, uh, I added, you know, the management side to the technical side. It wasn't just singly, you know, focused on electronic technology. There were a lot of other things I got to mix in. And now this message from ICOM America. I can already feel spring in the air and the great outdoors is calling. Get outside under the stars with one of ICOM's ultimate SDR transceivers. Stay connected while off the grid. 
The ICOM IC705 is the perfect transceiver for hams who enjoy both a great indoors and outdoors. It's the perfect QRP companion, with base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters, and is weighing in at just under 2 pounds. These features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall, 5 watts with a BP272 battery pack, or 10 watts with an external 13.8 DC power supply. Single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions. A micro USB connector, Bluetooth, wireless LAN, and an SD card slot. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. The HM243 speaker microphone is standard equipment. The basic accessory for the IC705 is the optional backpack, the LC192, with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or a day social distancing in the park. Visit the IC705 webpage to view accessories and free software available for download. If you lean to the VHF and above region, then you can create your own band opening with the ICOM IC9700. This transceiver radio brings direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. This all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you busy. These features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen color TFT LCD with real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation and full duplex operation in satellite mode. I believe it is the most exciting VHF and above transceiver on the market today. And finally, the ICOM IC7300 is the most advanced HF transceiver in its price class and ideal for the new ham or the experienced ham looking for an upgrade. The ICOM IC7300's high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design that will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages to reduce the generated inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 is the radio that changed the way entry-level HF is designed, and I own one and I think it's brilliant. Its features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete band pass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and an SD memory card slot. The real HF fund starts at ICOM. Be sure to buy one of these fine ICOM transceivers at your favorite ham radio dealer, and when you do it, tell them that you heard about it here at QSO today. And now, back to our QSO. It's my understanding that you're up in Oregon and that you're now sitting on 28 acres? That's correct. So tell us a little bit about that. You have the dream ham radio location? Well, it's probably uh, not far from what I dreamed of, you know, having. It may not be what everybody else uh, would dream of necessarily, but uh, certainly where I'm at now uh, for what I do in ham radio, it's working for me very well. Part of the reason I moved from Southern California to Oregon was to have the opportunity to have some space and be able to put up antennas. And also, I kind of grew tired of the hot, dry weather that you have so often in Southern California. It wasn't until I moved up here that I discovered that there are actually four different seasons of the year. This is true. Yeah. And uh, so I really kind of enjoy that. And I find that the, you know, just the cycle of nature going through the four seasons really helps alleviate boredom to some extent. Um, I live on 28 acres, as you say. I'm kind of in the middle of timber land. We're up on kind of the side of a hill with a great drop off to the west, north, and east. So that works very well for most of what I want to do with radio. It's not a great VHF location by any means, so that may not be a dream location for some people. But uh, as far as just having a lot of trees around me, not neighbors that I can't really see that are pretty far away. Uh, I even have underground power lines here, and it's a very quiet location. So um, it's probably as close to uh, you know what I would dream of for a ham radio location that, that I could come up with. So what's the current rig? I have basically two stations set up. Um, the competitive station for co- radio contesting and DXing is a pair of K3s. I've got a KPA 1500 amplifier, an Alpha 77, a uh, 10-tech Titan. And then over on the other side of the shack, 
with a very sturdy table. I've got a uh, Johnson Valiant 2, a Collins 75 A2, and 32 V3, and also a Ranger 2, and uh, a Bug. And I like to turn that on and just kind of enjoy what radio sounded like 50, 60 years ago. The receiver basically was built when I was born. That's your vintage station. And you operate both, what, AM and CW there? Well, I can operate AM. I haven't really... um, the, the transmitter I got, the Valiant, about two, three years ago, and I really haven't tested it out very much on AM. I know it works, but I'm not sure how good it sounds. I've come close to making my first contact with it on AM, but I haven't quite done that yet. I also have a Henry 2K Classic next to it, so I can put out a pretty good signal if I want to. The antennas uh, outside, I've got a 97-foot tower with a four-element 40-meter uh, beam. And a few other smaller towers sprinkled around with various monobanders and lots of receiving antennas strung between the trees, beverages, and the sort. It's my understanding that a beverage usually is, what, about a meter above the ground? Well, it can be that. Um, it, it's not super critical. It can be, I, I tend to put mine up high enough that I can't run into them. So they're at least two meters above the ground. And uh, it's just not super critical. If you look at the impedance calculations above ground, once you get like at five or six feet, it really isn't that critical. And they work very well for me here. I also have uh, a directional array of eight short verticals, a high Z array that works also very well as a receive antenna. I spend a lot of my time on 160 meters where these are very effective antennas for receiving. According to an article that you wrote, you have the top band disease. So maybe you can talk about right now, what is top band disease and how does the ham know he has it? Well, yeah, that's an article that I published, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 plus years ago on the web and uh, it's received a lot of attention. Um, Basically, top band disease is when you, uh, one of the things you have to understand about 160 meters is it's extremely challenging to work very far. Um, for a number of reasons, one of which is the antennas need to be very large, and a lot of people are using compromised antennas. Uh, It's very noisy. The the propagation is very similar to the AM broadcast band, and if you've spent any time listening to that, you know that you really don't hear stuff very far away, maybe a few states away. And also, it's very dependent upon what's going on with the sun. A lot of people pray for sunspots so that there's good radio conditions on 160 meters. It's actually the opposite. The band is better when there's less sunspots. Uh, So we're just actually getting off of a fairly good year. Um, So for me, I found that the challenge of the band to be more exciting, you know, talking to Europe on 160 meters is, is a big deal. And if you got on like 40 or 20 meters, talking to Europe is like ho-hum. Well, the band's open to Europe again. So it just felt more special. And also the the people there, you kind of get to know them because it's uh, a lot of the same people are there every morning trying to work Australia or whatever. Um, So a lot of my good friends are fellow 160 meter operators. So um, I've been very active on the band, and I'm close, I think, to 250 countries worked here from Oregon. It's a pretty good total. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah, from the West Coast. You, you can do better on the East Coast. Uh, there are people that have over 300 countries. I don't think I will ever be able to do that from the West Coast, but uh, I'm very proud of what I've been able to achieve, mostly since about 1986, after I had a competitive station here set up in Oregon. And the advantage of the beverage antennas is that they're low noise? Yeah, well, they're directional, which helps you with noise. So if you've got a lot of noise coming in from one direction, but the signal you're trying to get is in a different one, this lets you focus your ears, if you will, in the direction of the signal that you're trying to hear. So by having directivity, it provides you the opportunity to to improve the signal-to-noise ratio of the signal you're trying to hear. The beverage antenna, is the direction off the end or is it off the sides? It's off the end. Most beverages are terminated at what we call the far end. So the best direction is towards that termination. So in your case, you potentially have beverages going out in every direction that you want to work. Yeah, the more the better. You know, the, on 160 meters, people say you can't have too many different receiving antennas because you can maybe find one that under certain conditions work better than other ones. There are times 
uh, at a previous location where a dipole 10 feet off the ground down in a valley was actually a better receive antenna under some specific conditions than, say, a beverage antenna. And a lot of it has to do with the different angles of the signals, you know, and how they're coming at you, whether it's a high angle or a lower angle. Now, you mentioned you have two Elecraft K3 transceivers. Do you operate those SO2R? Yes, I do. And could you explain what SO2R is and how you operate it? So SO2R means single operator to radio. And basically, uh, the idea is, is whenever you're transmitting with one of your radios, and again, this is like on Morse code, and you typically have your computer generating your Morse code, so it's not something you're actually doing the opportunity is there to be listening on your other radio to try to maybe find somebody new to work on a different band or even potentially the same band if you uh, have enough isolation between your your two stations. And what this allows you to do is to tune around, see if other bands are opening up that maybe need more attention. It allows you to increase your multiplier totals because you can basically search around the band and find multipliers that are only calling CQ that you might miss otherwise. Uh, and also to increase your your contact total. In a contest like the AWRL sweepstakes on Sunday, the rates get pretty slow after you've worked all the hot shots. The extra effort that you put in with a second radio might make the difference between coming in number one or two in the contest or number 10. What's your favorite contest? I guess I would say my favorite contest is the National Contest Journal's CW Sprint. This is a four-hour event that runs twice a year. It's been going on since the... I think 1977 is when the first one was. There's been about 80 of them. And uh, it has a very unique uh, rule to it, which we call the QSY rule. Basically, if you get on a frequency and call CQ and somebody answers you, when you're done with that contact, you need to move your VFO and the guy you just worked gets to inherit the frequency that you called CQ on. So a lot of contests, you know, Big stations will just plop down on a frequency and just call CQ all weekend and work about a ton of guys. Uh, here you call CQ, you work one guy and you're done and you got to go find a new frequency. The easiest way to find a new frequency is to find somebody else calling CQ, answer them, and then inherit to their frequency. So there's a lot of knob twisting, if you will, um, to, to move around the band and work guys. And there are a lot of skills that this really emphasizes, like the ability to tune in to a new frequency, assess what's going on, determine quickly whether or not there's somebody there that's new for you to work, because you can only work people once on each band, and, you know, decide what the next thing to do is. And um, it's an extremely intense event. It lasts for four hours, and typically when I'm done with it, I am just totally drained. Now, you mentioned to me before we started that you're using Linux Mint. What is your um, what, what is your contest logging program? Well, back about 1989 or so, I decided to try this newfangled logging program stuff. That's back when CT was the primary logging program people used. There was also the NA program for domestic contests. And I just did not do well with the operator interface and I decided to write my own piece of software so the logging program I use is called TR log after N6TR my call sign and I'm I do have a Linux Mint computer here but I don't use use that for logging very much uh, I actually have a Windows 98 SE box here that I use with my with my old DOS program and that's primarily what I'm using um, we, there is a version of the program that's been recompiled by a, a guy in down Arizona, W9CF, who um, made my software basically work in Linux. And so um, my program can sort of run on that laptop. We actually did that in Germany as part of the WRTC event a few years ago. Um, and I'm currently, now that I'm retired and have more time, I'm kind of assessing what do I want to do? Do I just want to keep using this DOS program? Um, I've been able to find a compiler that pretty much supports most of the stuff that I've written before in a, like a Windows 10 environment or Linux, either one. And if I add some hardware over the USB port, maybe with an Arduino in it, um, I can probably recreate something that's very similar to what I would like to have. 
and without a lot of effort. So in a year or two, there may be a new version of TR log, if you will, that either runs on Windows and or Linux that um, gets supported with some sort of USB device to uh, handle the radio interface. Let me take a quick break to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast, and that's the Ham Radio Workbench podcast with George, KJ6VU, Jeremy, KF7IJZ, and it now includes Michael Walker, VA3MW, where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their Ham Radio Workbenches every two weeks. The group documents their projects and makes circuit boards available to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Jeremy may complain about the overall length of the podcast, but friends, let me tell you that I could listen to it all day, and that's good. Even if you are a seasoned ham radio builder or just getting started, be sure to join George, Jeremy, and Mike now for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast on every podcast player. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. And now back to our QSO today. What's your favorite operating mode? CW. I know you like the CW Sprint, but I also thought that perhaps you still like to operate single sideband. I will primarily operate sideband on six meters when the band is open. Uh, one of the things I really do not enjoy is the QRM that's usually associated with operating sideband, particularly in a contest. I will do a competitive contest entry on, on voice every three or four years, whether I need to or not, but that's about it. You know, if I'm just going to play around on the radio, Often I will go over to the vintage station and turn on the Collins 75A2 and tune around on 40 meters and, uh, you know, talk to somebody with my bug. So that's sort of my casual operating style. Do you ever operate digital modes? In a word, no. Um, for me, the magic of radio happens between the headphones, and there's nothing more exciting than hearing a weak signal building up a little bit so you can actually copy it. And to me, the idea of just looking at a computer screen just takes all of that out of it, and I do not find it interesting at all. I, I realize that digital modes, for some people, are maybe the only way they can make contacts due to their noise situation, but I just really am not excited very much at all with them. I have made a few QSOs on moon bounce on six meters, but using CW. I've got a nice antenna system that I hope to put up someday for two-meter moon bounce, but I'll probably be the one guy on there calling CQ on CW instead of using uh, one of the digital modes. What was Kids Day, and what was your role in it? Kids Day is an idea that came up when my kids were very young. They were kind of, you know, fascinated with the radio, and I think I bumped into somebody across town who had a license who also had a kid, and I was like, wow, we should get them on the air and have them talk to each other. And being a contester, I'm like, wow, you know, maybe if we have an event of some kind where we advertise it, we can get kids on the air to all talk to each other. So we held a, I think it was like maybe a six-hour event back uh, in about 1997 where we encouraged everybody to get their kids on the air and talk to each other. And we gave them a structured format for a contact where they would exchange their name, their age, and their favorite color. And it really just took that that whole idea just worked and took on a life of its own the club that i sort of used as a uh middleman and all this the boring amateur radio club ended up sponsoring the event we would had people printing up certificates and the idea just kept growing and i think after about three or four years it got big enough that the arrl got interested in it and i was just as you know as happy to let them take over administrating it so that i didn't have to deal with it anymore but that's basically how it got started. This also was a, during a time where uh, I had gotten signed up to, to have my kids' elementary school talk to the space station. Having you know a lot of exposure for ham radio for kids was just kind of a natural when I had my own kids back then that were you know of that nice age from like five to ten where they're really interested in this kind of stuff. Around that time, there was actually some national appreciation for what you did with Kids Day. What happened after that? Well, like I said, it took on a life of its, uh, on its own, and uh, because of that, I received, uh, I think it's primarily because of that, uh, the Dayton Ham, Year, Ham of the Year Award in 2003. So that was quite an honor, and it was just amazing to me that something that really was uh, just such an, a, a simple little idea, it just 
turned into a really big deal. And so that was really gratifying. Did any of your children end up becoming hams? Not yet. It's never too late, right? <laughs> we'll see. One of them, or uh, yeah, one of them is uh, holding on to her technical background. She's uh, extremely talented at math and uh, is actually uh, teaching or tutoring computer programming and, and things like that. So she's still kind of holding on to that a little bit and understands how a lot of things, you know, with electronics works. You're a professional tower climber. I see that you're available for hire in the Oregon area for people that want to put up or take down towers. And you have lots of years of experience. What is the number one safety concern that you have with radio amateurs? Well, you know, the tower climbing thing is something I have done. I'm probably starting to do a little bit less of it, at least professionally. Uh, my wife is my ground crew, and she's not really excited about me doing a lot more of it. I unfortunately had an eye injury. Uh, last fall where I'm mostly blind now in one eye and she feels that that is compromising my ability to be safe on a tower. So I'm probably going to be limited in what I can do. Um, I, I think the biggest safety concern I would have if I was going to say something to, you know, the, the ham population is, is basically assuming that something you put up 30 or 40 years ago is still as safe as it was when you first put it up. There's just a lot of things that need to be maintained and kept an eye on. Um, I, I've had friends have towers fall over because their guy wires rusted out, basically. I also have a good friend that also was in the tower business who unfortunately had a, what I would say, near-fatal accident on a tower that he assumed was secured at the ground but actually wasn't. And after he took the lower set of guy wires off, it fell over. So it's... Uh, it's a very unforgiving thing, and uh, you need to just be very cautious about what you're getting yourself into and not make any assumptions. I think one of the things I remember being a kid and climbing towers is that I don't think I was very aware of the safety equipment. I assumed that if somebody gave me an old lineman's belt with a hemp rope that went around it, that that was okay. Maybe there's some advice that you have for younger people that believe that they're invincible in their teens and early 20s and that perhaps they should pay attention to the equipment they're using. Well, certainly I was one of those teens and 20s that didn't pay attention to that. My wife really, as I said, is my ground crew, and she's really become my safety committee, and so she uh, makes sure that I am following good procedures and have all the right equipment. I remember the first time I climbed my tower back that I put up in 1971, uh, which was on the parent, the roof of my parents' house, I used a piece of guy wire through my belt buckles around the tower as a safety belt. Um, that allowed me to get done what I needed to do, but obviously it's a, a far cry from you know what's available as far as safety equipment. Climbing is something that's highly regulated by OSHA, and there's a lot of stuff out there that... Uh, is available. Basically, I think, you know, the, the basic concept is to always have yourself secured so that if something happens, you don't fall. So, you know, my days of free climbing are gone where I just, you know, scamper up a tower like it's a ladder and then put my belt on. Um, I have the ability to get around obstacles by clamping onto the tower and then moving my belt above the obstacle or below it. Wearing things like hard hats or basically like a bicycle helmet if you're up on the tower. So, you know, if you do climb into something you didn't see, you don't knock yourself out, just all sorts of things like that. Staying hydrated, just all these things we never thought of when we were a kid. I also was a free climber, and now that I'm older, I can't even go on the roof. Right. Have you done the expeditions? I guess I kind of have. I haven't really, uh, you know, done one of these uh big de expeditions where you get on a boat and travel for 10 days and spend three weeks on an an island with a bunch of penguins and then come back. I've got some good friends that have, and I've thought about doing that sort of thing, but it may be that the window of opportunity for me to do that is, is closing. I don't know. Um, I have operated from a number of DX locations, primarily around contests. I operated uh, in a CQ worldwide phone contest as part of a multi multi from Qatar uh, as a 73 a, I actually drove from my house near Geneva, Switzerland to EA9 and did a contest there. And I've operated a number of contests from various places in the Caribbean and Central America, like Costa Rica, 
the Galapagos Islands, uh, Aruba, and I've done a few contests from other exotic places like uh, Singapore and Russia, to name a few. 4U1 ITU was very close to when my house when I lived near Geneva, so I got to operate a lot from there. How is it that you found yourself living in Geneva? My job took me there. I was working for a company that had some installations in Europe, and they needed to upgrade their technical capability. And the way that that worked out is they hired somebody that lived there and brought them back to the States for a year to train them. And during that same year, they sent me over there to sort of fill the gap. So I spent uh, a lot of time in the south of France and also in Manchester, England, maintaining sites and doing a new installation in Switzerland. And it was just a great opportunity to really, you know, live somewhere else and learn a different culture and understand what it's like to be on the other end of speaking a second language. I can relate to that. Were you active in ham radio? Very much so. Um, I, I really made sure that I could. We actually ended up renting a house, so I had an antenna and I had a TS-430 and I, I bought a Heathkit single tube uh, amplifier that I built actually there and got it running during the uh, WPX CW contest. And so I was actually on the air like within a week or two of uh, moving there. And then I also made about 25,000 contacts, I think, at 4U1 ITU, the headquarters Geneva station, which was a lot of fun too, because basically it, that one station is its own DXCC country. So you get a lot of interest. How do you find amateur operations in Europe different from amateur operations in America? For me, I was astounded at the level of activity that there was like on CW uh, during the daytime, like on 40 meters. Being on the West Coast and never operating from the East Coast, I'm somewhat isolated from a lot of the activity that you hear uh, from Europe, uh, just because the smaller stations have a harder time getting their signals to all the way to Oregon. So it was very common for me to get on 40 meter CW uh, in the middle of the daytime and call CQ and just have a pileup of, of people from Eastern Europe. I just had no idea there was that much activity. Of course, this is back in 1990 and it may be different now. Just an incredible amount of activity in, in Eastern Europe. Now, do you find that European hams, or at least the ones in those days, that they were operating 100 watts in a wire or less or were they high power operators? Well, there's obviously a lot more uh, people running 100 watts on a wire. I mean, just uh, a lot of people like that there. Most people that live in Europe either are living out in the country and have a lot of room or they're in the city and really don't have very much room. So uh, there, there aren't really a lot of suburb-type places for them to live. So um, I think I got exposed uh, to a lot of hams that otherwise wouldn't you know, I wouldn't be able to work just because, you know, the, the propagation on 40 meters is such that like it, somebody in Ukraine or something would be like 40 or 50 over S9, just an incredible signal. So it was easy to work them. We take it for granted when we live over here in Israel that we actually hear all these guys all the time. I'm sure you do. Yep. What's the project on your amateur radio workbench? If I was to look over here, the one that's currently sitting there is a beacon for 432 and 2 meters that kind of got kludged together a couple of weeks ago. It needs to move to a more permanent place out of the way. But um, a long time ago, I had a beacon set up at a friend's house, but he has since moved away and gave me back some of the old equipment I had. And so um, I found an Arduino board I had and figured out a way to program it to send Morse code and hooked it up to an, an IC706 I had laying around and this same Radio Shack uh, handy talkie that I had modified to send CW, which is very chirpy, um, and then put up a couple little antennas that are outside, not very high right now. So uh, there was, you know, people asking if there were any beacons in Portland and there really weren't any. So I thought I would put a couple more on. There are a useful tool for people that are trying to make sure that their systems are working in that there's not a lot of activity on these bands. So if there's nothing there, you don't really know if your receiver is working or not. So at least now there's a, a beacon, which may not be very strong, but at least it's something that you can use to tell whether or not your 
antennas are working. Are these antennas horizontally polarized? Yeah. The one on two meters is just a dipole. Uh, it's actually just a driven element from a beam. And then the one on 432 is a little uh, loop antenna that's about two inches in diameter. It doesn't look like much like an antenna at all. Uh, at the previous location where I had this set up, there was actually a time where that 432 beacon was heard down in Arizona, which was amazing considering it only runs about 500 milliwatts and Arizona is like a thousand miles away. It was pretty unbelievable. So they were taking advantage of maybe some tropo ducting or some inversion or something like that? Must have been. I found out about it. This guy showed up on six meter sideband and said he heard my beacon. And I'm like, okay, which one? Because I had him on two meters and, and he said on 432. And all the locals were like listening to this QSO and were like, really? And then, you know, the, the thing sounds really chirpy. Uh, I wish I could play it for you. Um, but we eventually got the guy to describe, you know, without telling him that it sounded chirpy, you know, what it sounded like enough that we, we believe that he actually did hear that signal that far away. I don't think I've spoken to very many hams that are running beacons. Do they all occupy the same frequency? Are they continually transmitting or are they transmitting and then waiting for a while and then transmitting? There's, there's different rules uh, regarding beacons, depending upon what band you're on. As you get up into VHF and UHF, there's really not very much limitation to them. There are kind of gentleman agreements on what part of the band that they'll be in so that they don't interfere with no other operations. So they don't have to actually be on the same frequency, but they tend to be kind of in the same part of the band, which is also handy if you're looking for one. A similar thing like on 10 meters, where most of the beacons are between 28.2 and 0.3, the beacons I've got running the, that's uh, just CW, and it's the same CW being sent on both rigs. I've got three different messages that come up in random order, basically. And basically, they just announce, you know, ID the station with a call sign and give a six-digit grid square, which narrows down the location of it pretty well. Uh, one of the other messages also indicates, you know, what, what the altitude is above sea level and the name of the town. So... They pretty much just transmit over and over. It's probably like 15-second message that repeats every 30 seconds, something like that. And now this message from LDG Electronics. LDG Electronics, our new sponsor, is a family-owned company that manufactures sophisticated antenna tuners, ballons, and antenna accessories. Check out their new Z100A antenna tuner for your shack or portable operation that includes LDG's famous 10-to-1 tuning and plug-and-play operation. For more information, click on the banner in this week's show notes page. And when you make your LDG purchase, tell them that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. Is there a network of maybe SDR receivers or receivers that listen to beacons and kind of report on the web where they're being heard? I don't know if there is anything like that that's focused on beacons. There are a couple of different other things going on. There's the reverse beacon network, which is a network of receivers that are listening in the CW parts of the band. And if you call CQ on CW and one of these things hears you, it'll spot you. So those are very handy for finding out when particular bands might be opening or if you're CQing like on 160 meters and nobody's answering you, but you want to know where is my CQ being heard, you can bring up that web page and you can see, oh, I'm I'm an S unit above the noise in Australia, so the band's open. It's just that nobody is answering me. Also, the the new digital modes provide opportunities for you know that type of thing too. You can just leave those running and kind of snoop on the frequency and and see what what's coming in and what what the uh, signal strengths are. I don't know if those are tied into a network or not, but likely if they're not, they will be at some point. Some point. What do you think your greatest challenge is right now as an amateur radio operator? Interesting question. I think the way I'd probably answer that is the greatest challenge is to try to um, make sure that I am putting myself in a position to mentor new hams. I found myself kind of doing that through the associations I had at my employment. There would be people that knew I was a ham and they want to get into it, so they come over and start asking me questions and talk to me. Now that I'm retired, I don't really have that kind of interaction with people. 
And so it's very easy for me to isolate myself and just focus on talking to people over the radio with people who are already hams. And so maybe one of the biggest challenges is figuring out a way to maintain some sort of enthusiasm and availability towards new hams. Um, For example, uh, a friend of mine passed away about a year ago and a guy I never heard of was interested in one of his towers. So he came and helped take down that tower and he's pretty much a new ham. He has a lot of questions and I need to, you know, make sure I foster that friendship and make myself available to him and, uh, spend time mentoring him and showing him how this stuff's done. Those of us that have been doing this a long time take it for granted how easy for us it is to put a PL259 on the end of a cable, but for someone that's never done it before, it's a daunting task. Exactly. What most excites you about amateur radio now? Huh, another good question. You know, for me personally, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is just building out this station that I have here. Uh, the station is kind of on side of a hill, and there's a lot of topology here to deal with. And, for example, one of my best antennas to Europe on 20 meters is on a tower that's only 25 feet tall, but it's situated at a point where there's a great drop-off towards Europe. So I have a lot of building materials here. Uh, I've got a lot of time, a lot of space. And for me personally, it's just, uh, you know, figuring out, okay, what's the next antenna project? Um, I put up, I've been hit this location just over three years, but I already have four towers up and have ideas of, you know, more towers. And I've got maybe 300 feet of tower sections laying on the ground. And also I just inherited a bunch of aluminum so I could build most any antenna that I want to. So it's just uh, figuring out, you know, which, which things are going to work, what things to try and how to uh, make the station as competitive as I can in the radio contests that I get into. So a guy with a lot of aluminum and a lot of tower sections lying around must have a pretty decent metal shop? Well, maybe not a great one, but, you know, some of the basic tools, uh, like I can, I can cut a piece of aluminum pretty well with a chop you know, saw with the right kind of blade on it, and then if I file it enough, it's nice and smooth. Obviously, a drill press is an essential I built uh, pretty much from pieces my own four-element, 40-meter four, beam on a 48-foot boom. The antenna weighs about 280 pounds. Um, got lots of great advice from people that had built that kind of stuff before. Uh, I think I spent about $700 buying U-bolts for it. You know, once you've done a big antenna like that, m- most of the other antennas are at least half or a quarter that size, and so they don't seem quite as daunting. So I, I do feel like I can generate most anything. What kind of rotator does it take to turn a 40 meter beam that weighs 280 pounds? A very robust one. Um, I think pretty much the standard answer you would get from most anybody that you ask that question to would be a prop pitch. And that's what I'm using. Um, So prop pitch is a, a motor that was used primarily in world war II aircraft to adjust the pitch of the props uh, to optimize them for the flying conditions that they're being used. And they turned out with some modifications to be excellent antenna rotators. There are people that work on modifying them for amateur radio use. And I sent mine to a friend of mine that does that kind of thing. Now I can turn my antenna. I can even hook it up over the internet so that a, a remote operator that's using my station can turn the antenna where he wants to, to turn it. Now, I would imagine that something like that that was on an aircraft doesn't work on 12 volts DC or 110 volts. No, the motor itself, uh, I forget if it'll run on AC or not, um, but it's pretty much a DC motor, maybe 30 volts or so. The uh, controller for it, I I use one of these green Heron prop pitch uh, control boxes. It'll do pulse width modulation so it can taper the speed of the, uh, the motor for ramping up and ramping down when you start, you know, turning it from a dead stop. And uh, it's been very reliable for me. What advice would you give to new or returning hams to the hobby? It's hard to give advice without really understanding what it is that they want to achieve with the the hobby. Uh, It'd be easy for me to say, go off and get a piece of vintage gear and uh, challenge yourself to use that to make contacts. But uh, maybe somebody is more interested in having a handy talkie and being, you know, part of the emergency preparedness with the fire station or something like that. 
ham radio is just so many different types of special interests that depending upon what it is that you're interested in, that would be the area that you go off and pursue. I guess my advice would be, you know, look for the things that you think are fun that, uh, that are going to give you enjoyment and try to focus on those. If you're not having fun doing it, it's not, it's not a hobby anymore. I think there's so much in our tent that if one thing doesn't bring enjoyment, there must be something else, something for everyone, perhaps. Yeah, and you can adapt that to your own personal situation. Obviously, if I was living in a townhome in the city, I wouldn't be building all these big towers and antennas, and maybe I'd be doing a lot more stuff with digital modes or with computers or remote operations or things like that. So in addition to your interests, you obviously have to factor in what your situation is. Tree, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I thank you so much for allowing me to interview you and talk to you about your ham radio life and your ham radio station. So with that, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. All right. Thank you very much, Eric. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Tree. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put an N6TR in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric, 4Z1UG, 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.